name's Heather Nelson. I'm the Chief Exec of uh, Black Health Initiative. That's based in Leeds, in West Yorkshire. Um, we work wherever our funding takes us, um, as we're multi-funded. So, at 10 minutes, so I'm going to try and speak fast. I'm going to try and leave my Jamaican accent behind so that you can all understand me without any translation. So, here we go. So, pre-COVID-19. Okay, so, in our opinion, I'm very much going to speak about um, my experience through Black Health Initiative, but also which is representative of the Black um, voluntary sector. And I'm very specific in saying Black rather than BAME. I actually don't like the, um, the name BAME. I think it's very divisive. It means white and then all the others, when really we're always trying to work together. So that's why I kind of leave it apart. Plus, you know, you, you, we have you know, the South Asian community, the, the African Caribbean, the Black British, etc., the East Asian. We're all different. We're not a homogenous group. So what might be an issue for one is not an issue for another. So going on to um, the level sustained community groups. Pre-COVID, I do believe that it was getting stronger. I do believe that there were more small groups actually popping up. And a bit like what Kim's just said, you know, the £500 that was going there to help them um, do what they wanted to do and to champion the works that they wanted within their community was happening. But it was a bit divisive because it meant that there was a lot of competition there. Um, but it did encourage people who had a new understanding of working together to actually come together. It was getting sustained. Grassroots organisations were actually building on what they were doing. The, the pendulum had switched from consortiums to actually looking at those organisations, small and medium, that were working within their communities, had their specialities, and were actually making a difference because they, they had the trust of those that they were serving, but also then linked them to the larger either charities or the statutory bodies who then could have access to them. So we could we no longer had to use the term hard to reach, under the radar, and all the other things that meant that people said that they couldn't reach us when we could as specialists. It also meant that we had effective partnerships. So the statutory bodies understood that we could actually reach those people that they said they couldn't reach, and therefore they were funding them. The issue was, was that the funding was going to the larger third sector rather than those that were very much grassroots and had their immediate access. It did actually mean that we, the um, smaller charities and organisations were getting subfunded by the larger ones to ensure that they were meeting their actual targets, which in itself was a, a, an issue. Now, let's go on to during COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, during COVID-19, as we all know, the government came out with different support initiatives for us. So there was the furlough scheme. They were um, grants for larger charities to continue their work if they couldn't do their, their fundraising, which was predominantly outside. It was very much about um, getting together and raising money. There was also loans. The loans, however, weren't, um, they weren't OK for the, small, the smaller to medium um, organisations because it, it banked on the fact that you'd be able to pay back the monies and that was very precarious for some of the smaller to medium organisations. The local third sector response to COVID-19 was very, in my opinion, very adaptable. Straight away, as soon as there was a lockdown, um, they, they galvanised, the volunteers came together, and I think Carmack said this, it was very much about local people understanding the local needs, the third sector organisations that were there, understanding what was needed, didn't bother looking at policies and procedures in regards to let's do a template, let's then look at forward planning, but actually started the work. So you had people setting up the food banks, people cooking like BHI, we started cooking, we were doing 150 meals over two days, because although people were um, distributing emergency bags of food, there was a many people who weren't able to feed themselves, people with dementia, people who had mobility issues, etc. So very much going on and, and adapting what they were doing. Very much so we used virtual. So the, for the younger generation, there was very much about virtual groups and support sessions. We had um, we used checking in programs where you check in with friends and relatives to make sure that they were OK. Um, and, and that still continues. And I'm, I'm sure it will continue to a certain degree um, post COVID. So while we were doing that, am I OK for time? I'm really rushing this through, so my apologies. Um, so while we were doing that and while we all concentrated on the pandemic, what also happened was the impact of the murder of George Floyd. Now, for many, especially those of us who are black, that really hit us. 
And for, for most of us who I've been speaking to, not just locally, but nationally and internationally, it actually was like another trauma. So we were dealing, in essence, with two things that were really traumatic to um, those communities and those who, who felt a connection, either because they were male, they were black, they came from black community. And then we had some of those who were allies who stood at the side and actually said, this is not on. We look, many people look at racism or racist behavior to be very violent. While we saw that murder and it was very explicit, racism is an everyday occurrence for many of us who are black or brown people. You know, and microaggression is, is there, institutional racism is there, but yet still we're, we're expected to continue on and continue with the work and be productive without actually re recognising that this has a psychological impact on those of us who are actually going through this trauma. What are we doing to actually support our black staff? And, and that's something that I know um, some of my white colleagues um, people that we've worked with have asked me, what can I do so it's not tokenistic? You know, putting out a statement's all very good, but then what actions are you taking? Are you making sure if you're an employer that your black employees are okay? You know, do they need any additional support? And you as yourself, are you calling out racism when you see it? It's not just about your policy. Most of us have equal opportunity policies, diversity policies, but what are we doing with them? And actually, what are we doing as individuals to make society a fairer place for everybody? So when, while, while we're talking about that, we're also trying to balance the work that we're doing. And as a black organisation, BHI has been doing that balancing what we are doing in response to COVID, but also dealing with the trauma that many from the community are coming in with, which is mental ill health, anxiety from the older people who are scared to go out, anxiety for the older people who don't know whether to get their older people and vulnerable people who don't know whether to get the flu jab because they're now hearing misinformation about the flu jab and the COVID jab being um, integrated so therefore they don't want that also the young black men who are coming to us because they want um counseling and support because of you know the disproportionate stop and search um victimization that they're feeling so we should as partners if we're all working together recognize that different organizations and different individuals are actually having additional issues that are compounding the impact of covid19 in regards to Post COVID nineteen, am I still doing okay? Yes. Okay, I'm still doing okay. One minute. One minute, right? Okay. Um, in regards to post COVID nineteen, let's have a look at the, um, the 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 sustainability of the third sector. Now, um, Professor Hill just said that um, Donna said about trusting the third sector. You do need that trust because we are able, we are more than capable, and we do know what's going on within the communities that we serve. The, 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 those that are most marginalised have been the most vulnerable during this period, and it's organisations within the third sector that can do the immediate response and then continue with the long-term response with our potential partners. What we have to look at as well is that we don't lose the richness of the diversity of the third sector, because those that are smaller and more specialised and, and actually dealing with communities of interest are usually the ones who are struggling with the funding and the finances. And the emergency funding was usually three to six months and it's coming to a close. So we really need to show value of those in the third sector by investing in them and investing in them quickly so that we can maintain the work that we've been doing during COVID and actually progress post COVID. We don't want to lose that richness. 